we are going to be continuing with a series which we started like t- this morning, which is God's great plan, okay, and God's plan. And tonight we're going to be more specifically looking at the story of Joseph. But what's so exciting is that the story of Joseph is part of a much bigger plan than just his own little story. Because sometimes we look at the story of Joseph and we see, okay, it means that God can take any bad situation and just turn it into a good one. Whatever bad happens, he can turn it around and give it good, which is exactly what happens, and that is exactly God's character, and that's what he does in situations. But tonight, we're going to be looking and seeing a bit more than just that situation being turned around, but seeing how it's an integral part of God's great plan, how it actually connects Genesis to Revelation, how it connects the beginning of the covenant of God to Jesus coming one day and saving the whole of, eternity, uh, the whole of humanity. And so that's what we're going to be looking at and seeing how this story of Joseph is so much more than just what happened in his own little bubble and in his own little circumstance. So just to get a kind of idea of perspective and seeing only half a piece, because sometimes we see Joseph, and if you only, if, as Joseph was going through all these different trials that we'll be going through just now, you'll see that if you only see each individual circumstance, it's very difficult to see the bigger picture. It's difficult when you don't know what the whole picture and the whole plan looks like. It's difficult when you only have a tiny piece, and that's all you're given to kind of determine what things are going to look like. So, for like the first time ever, I have a slide, okay? And I'm going to do a quick quiz, all right? It's a picture quiz. I want you to guess what object that little tiny piece of the picture actually is. And it's going to be difficult because, I mean... Really? Can you tell what that is? Okay. Does anyone know what that little square in the middle is? Okay. The beige stuff is just background. That little square in the middle, do you know what that is? Anyone? No? Any guesses? Edge of a door. Okay. We have some guess. But your answer is incorrect. Okay. That is a little close-up of a Coke bottle. Okay. You would have never understood that. Okay. Because you didn't know the whole picture. You only had the little block. Okay. Next one. What is that? Any guesses whatsoever? It's a mirror? A frame? Okay, those are clothes, but no, not anything like that. It is a key, okay? You would have never got that because you don't know what the whole picture looked like. Next one. This one you should get. I mean, if you look at that, come on. Everyone? An apple. Yes, that's correct, okay? It's a close-up of an apple. You guys are correct. Yes, you got one, okay? Not doing too bad. Only 33% so far. What is that? Yes. A pole? No. The moon? No. Okay, well, you didn't get it. It's a close-up of a pencil. You're never going to get that. Next one. What is that? That you can get. Wait, one, two, three. A kiwi. Yes. Okay, so you got one. So you had to throw a couple of easy ones in so you don't get despondent and we get some guessing going. Okay, what is that? What? Someone actually said it. What? Earth, no. I'm assuming someone said it, even if you didn't. It's a bird, okay? It's a close-up of the bird. This one, what is that? Can anyone tell me what that is? What? A roof? Matches? No. It's a cake. Oh, it was an obvious one. (laughs) And this one? This is actually the last one, okay? If you get this, like, it'll be amazing. Yes. Plate, no. Yeah? A bowl, no. That is the close-up of a piece of an engine. All right, this, okay? So, and that's all of them. So you can put that off. But my point is, when you only get a small piece of the picture, it's like getting one piece of a giant puzzle. You don't always know, and <laughs> quite clearly you don't always know, what the bigger picture is, what the bigger plan is. But you trust that that little piece is part of something. It belongs somewhere. It has a purpose to it. And that's what we're going to be looking at the story of Joseph. Is the fact that the whole story of Joseph is one piece in a giant plan and a giant puzzle that God has created. And it shows, and I'm going to go through exactly how that happens. But when we have that small piece, we need to trust that there's a bigger plan and a bigger picture. So before I continue, I just want to open up in a word of prayer. Lord, I just thank you for this opportunity that we have to get together and go through your word. And I pray that you'll just highlight some of the things that happened to Joseph in his life and the way you worked in miraculous ways. And that we'll just see your plan and your great picture 
for humanity and your plan for mankind going forward and how eventually you came to save the world through your son. Lord. But I pray that you'll bless us this, this evening and that you take all the glory um, for everything that's said tonight. In your mighty name I pray, amen. So it all starts, the story of Joseph technically starts with a man named Abram. Okay? That's actually where it all begins. And it's very important that we cover two specific verses before we even go into the story of Joseph. Because it actually sets up exactly what's going to happen in Joseph many years later. So Genesis 12, verse 2 to 3, okay, says, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all people on earth will be blessed through you. So it starts off there with God speaking to Abram, saying, listen, I'm making a promise with you. I'm making a covenant with you. You are going to be my chosen people. You are going to turn into a great nation. This is the beginning of the Israel people. The nation of Israel is all starting here with this covenant right in the beginning. So God's making this promise that he'll take care of him and use him and his family to bless the rest of the world. So that's how it starts. Then it goes on to Genesis 15, verse 13 to 16. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites is, has not yet reached its full measure. And so what a great way to start your covenant, saying, I'm going to bless you, I'm going to take care of you, you're going to be people, but before you get what I'm promising you, you're going to have to spend 400 years enslaved, oppressed, in a land that's not your own, and then the time will come where you will get the land that I'm promising you, take you to that promised land. So this covenant starts off in this way, but we start to see that God already has a plan, because it says here in the last verse, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. You see, God knew that it was going to take 400 years for the Amorite people, the people in Canaan, the Canaanites, to eventually get to a point where they were so wicked and so sinful that God's judgment is going to have to come upon them. So he told him, he's like, Abraham, just listen, I've got this promise for you. I promise I'll use you to bless you and bless the nations, but just have to wait 400 years. Because then when the time is right, your generations, your descendants will take over the promised land. Because we see in Deuteronomy 9 verse 5, it says this is now with Joshua going to take over and going to now conquer the land of Canaan, the promised land, 400 years later. It is not because of your righteousness or your integrity that you are going to take possession of their land. But on account of the wickedness of these nations, the Lord your God will drive them out before you to accomplish what he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so there we see the fulfillment. 400 years earlier, God says, listen, if you can wait 400 years, these people, the Amorites, will become so sinful that I'm going to cast judgment upon them in the future. Just trust me, that's what's going to happen. 400 years go by. Here's Joshua about to conquer. And, he, and God's saying, no, no, it's not because of you, not because how righteous you are, not because of your integrity, but it's because of a promise I made 400 years ago to Abram. They are now wicked, and they now need judgment to come upon them. And now all of a sudden, Joshua's conquest makes sense to Joshua. That they're not just going to a random land to just take over for the sake of it, like because they want to reclaim land that was once promised to them but never really was theirs. It's not like anything like that. It's about God fulfilling the judgment which he knew was going to come and he had already seen was going to take place. And so immediately there we see this massive plan already like coming out to be over 400 years. But the story of Joseph takes place within the 400 years. So that eventually Joshua would be able to come and take over the land and cast a judgment, which God made a promise would happen so many years earlier. And Joseph is one of those little pieces in that puzzle, which then is part of a massive puzzle, which will unfold a bit going forward. So the story of Joseph sets up things that the chosen people are rescued from starvation and the tribe of Judah is prevented from being extinguished so that the Lion of Judah would eventually come one day. That's the crux of the story. So I'm going to go through the, the story of Joseph 
And I was talking to, to Brett and Uncle Basil saying, like, when you tell someone to speak on Joseph, it's like so many chapters and so many things happen. So I'm going to try and condense his story so you can get the full Joseph story in, like, one mini story, opposed to being here for the rest of the week. But I'm going to do my best. So it starts off with Abraham. He has a son named Isaac. Isaac has two sons, Jacob and Esau. Jacob, Jacob gets the promise and the blessing and the covenant to go forward and carry the people. Then he has 12 sons, of which one is Joseph. Okay, so that's from Abraham to Joseph. Now we're at Joseph. Now our story can begin. Joseph goes out in the field. His father says, listen, I want you to go check on your brothers. They're busy working in the field. So he goes out there, but at the same time, he's had dreams of his brothers and his family bowing down and worshiping him. Now, if you know the culture back then, the youngest people, he was the second youngest brother out of the 12. Back then, the youngest do not tell the oldest ones that you're going to bow down to me. It's always the younger ones bowing down to them. So they got jealous, and they plot, you know what? Here's this dreamer just giving these dreams. Who does he think he is telling us that we're going to bow down to him? So they start plotting to kill him. So then they decide, okay, they're out in the field. They see him coming. You know what? We have to kill him. We're going to stab him, whatever it is kill him, and we go home and tell dad, yeah, someone else, some lion or something ate him, okay? But then Reuben steps up, and he's like, no, 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 guys, we can't kill him. He's our brother. Like, we love him. We just can't kill him. So he goes, Reuben walks away. While he's away, the rest of the brothers say, you know what, we're going to throw him in this well. Put him in this well. He's in this hole. He's trapped. By the time Reuben gets back, the brothers have already sold him into slavery, okay? Now, first of all, something I just want to bring your attention to, like a side note, if you read the whole story of Joseph, I'm pretty sure you can tell from his character and who he is that when he came to tell his family about the dreams, he wasn't boasting and saying, oh, I'm so much better than you. He's saying, listen, this is the dreams I had, and his brothers got jealous from that. But when you look at the character of Joseph, I I struggle very much to see him as coming across boasting everything. When everything he's done after has just shown the righteousness that he has and how obedient he was and faithful he was to God going forward. That's just a, a little side note on his dreams. So then... They think by them selling him, they are now removing these dreams and killing the dreams and getting rid of the dreams, which are now haunting them and saying, oh, my word, I'm going to take over and all this. They think by selling him, they're getting rid of the dreams. And what they don't know is that they're actually fulfilling the dreams by doing this. So they're completely oblivious to what they're doing and what part of this big plan that they're actually playing. So then Joseph lands up in Egypt. Now he's as a slave, gets bought by a man named Potiphar, Okay. Now, Potiphar, he kind of has him as a slave, but then he realizes that everything Joseph does is, like, perfect. He's making everything work smoothly. Um, He's taking care of the people. He's such a nice bloke, you know. And eventually, he's like, you can be in charge of my whole household. So other than Potiphar, Joseph is now in charge of the whole household. But now Potiphar's wife looks at him and says, yeah, that's a strapping young lad, eh? And she really wants him, okay? She's hungry for him now, okay? So she comes up, you know what, tries to seduce him, you know, and then Joseph, what do you think? You know what, this is obviously wrong, I've got to flee. So he turns and runs, she grabs his cloak, rips it off him. So, I mean, that would be an embarrassing run down the street. But anyway, he keeps running, no clothes, whatever it is. And then Potiphar comes home and the wife says, you know what, Joseph tried to seduce me and tried to take hold of me. So now Potiphar is deceived, okay, because he's heartbroken. This guy that he's put in charge of his house is now trying to take his wife. It's, It's horrible for him. So what? Pops him in jail. So what is Joseph's reward for being righteous? What is Joseph's reward for doing the right thing? Go to jail, okay? Sometimes we always do the right thing and it backfires and something horrible happens. We know how it feels when we do the right thing, but we're the ones who feel the pain. We do the right things and we're the one who are the ones that basically get punished at the end of the day. So that's part of his wife. Now he's in prison. So now he's chilling in prison and the whole time he's being like, obedient to God. So now he's in prison. There's his two other prisoners, the cupbearer and the baker of Pharaoh, okay? They're sitting there, and they now have these two dreams. Now, Joseph is sitting there. He says, okay, I hear your dreams. Let me tell you what these dreams mean. Now, the Lord blesses him with the knowledge to tell them what the dream's about. Tells him the dreams. He says, as long as when you get out, please just remember me, okay? I'll tell you this dream, but just just remember me, because I don't want to be in jail for the rest of my life. So, baker goes out, as the dream said, dead, okay? But then the cupbearer, reinstated, now next to Pharaoh. What does he do? Forgets about him, okay? Forgets all about Joseph. What's Joseph's reward for helping the cupbearer? Stay in prison for two more years, okay? 
wow, he must be feeling great at this point. But what? He stays righteous and stays obedient to God. Eventually, he's such a good guy and he's doing such good work within the prison, the officer in charge makes him in charge of the whole prison. 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 Yeah. In charge of the prison of prisoners. Okay? Now he's in charge. So now that whole situation. So keep serving, keep serving. Eventually, Pharaoh has a bunch of dreams. No one can interpret it. Absolutely no one. And eventually, the penny drops, and the cup is, oh, now I remember. There's a guy named Joseph. He's been in jail for two years. Okay? He says, he can tell you exactly what your dreams mean. Joseph comes to him and says, you know what? It's not me who tells you the dream. God has told me what the dreams are and what they mean. So he tells him, we're going to have all these years, seven years of plenty and the seven years of famine. There's going to be a starvation everywhere. But don't worry, this is how we do it. We save and we do this and we store it up. Now he's sitting there. Pharaoh's like, wow, you're the only one who can tell me my dream. And I like your strategy, okay? Puts him second in charge. The only person with more authority in the whole of Egypt is Pharaoh himself. Now we start to see, okay, things are happening. Throughout this whole time, Joseph is obedient. He lives a righteous life. Wherever he is, at whatever circumstance he finds himself. Eventually, his brothers come because they don't have any food. So his, their father sends the brothers and says, go to Egypt, go get some food. They get before Joseph and they don't even recognize him anymore. They're bowing down to him and saying, can we please have food? We're starving. If you don't give us food, we will die. Eventually he reveals himself. Hey, what up? It's me. Okay? Tells him. He reveals it. They are petrified. The man they try to kill. Immediately his dreams have come true because they're bowing before him, begging him, just as he said long ago. And so when these brothers, the killers, were trying to get rid of the dreams, they were fulfilling the dream the whole time. And they didn't even know anything about it. Joseph didn't know anything about what was taking place. He knew that no matter where he was, he had to be righteous Where he was, he had to be obedient and trust that God was with him through it all. No matter what it felt like. Being in prison must have been horrendous. Side note, I went to to prison yesterday. Um, I really did, but not for me going to prison. But I went there to go and look at one of these restorative justice programs where you take convicts and restore them back with their families, back into society. I'm telling you, if you want your heart to just like melt, you go watch one of these things. I promise you to see the heartbreak, but the restoration that takes place between a convict and their family, it's unbelievable. But one thing I can say is when you're walking down the passage with all the people who aren't in that restorative justice program, they're banging on the gates, they're shouting, they're calling weird things out. It's a scary place to be. And I wasn't even locked up, but I was in that area, and I'm telling you, your nerves in that place. I can't imagine what he was going through, being in the prison, falsely accused of all these other prisoners. But he still chose to be obedient to God. Still chose to be righteous and live the life that God wants him to live. So the whole story of Joseph, okay, because now this is how the Egyptians, well, how the Israelites land up becoming Egyptians and coming into the land of Egypt. Because remember in the beginning, God made the covenant saying, your people will be enslaved and oppressed for 400 years in a land that's not their own. This is the point where that all starts. The 400 years start here when now Jacob and his family have now come into Egypt through Joseph. Because Joseph said, you know what, I'm not just going to give you food. You and the rest of my family can come and live in Egypt. And so we see now God's plan Fulfilling his covenant through Joseph. Now, within those 400 years, there's a whole long story. I won't get into all those details about how eventually the nation came big and then Pharaoh was feeling like they were going to take over, so oppressed them and so on, so, so on, and they became slaves. But the point is the story of Joseph is where God's covenant starts to take root and starts to take place. The little piece in the big picture. Genesis 45, verse 5. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save the lives that God sent me ahead of you. 
This is Joseph comforting his brothers. The ones that were planning to kill him, sold him as a slave. He then, because of being sold as a slave, had to go on that whole long route, go to the prison, all of that stuff. He looks at his brother and says, you know what? Don't worry. God sent me ahead of you to save lives. And immediately he's saying, you know what, this isn't your plan. It wasn't your plan to kill me. It wasn't your plan to make me a slave. It was God's plan to save the lives of many. And immediately he tells him, it's God's plan who sent me. It wasn't you making me a slave. It was God sending me. God used the sins of his brothers and the sins of part of his wife to move in such a way to accomplish his covenant and his promise to his people. Psalm 105, verse 16 to 17. He called down famine on the land and destroyed all of the supplies of food. And he sent a man before them, Joseph, sold as a slave. It's God's plan. And what does it say here? It says, and he sent down the famine. God sent the famine. God sent Joseph. This isn't one of those stories where it's about saying, you know, Satan had a plan to ruin the lineage of Jesus, and Jesus and God counteracted that with his plan. It wasn't one of those things. It's not one where it's one plan because of what Satan did. No, it was God's plan from the beginning that these were going to take place. God brought the famine, famine, and God sent Joseph to change and to fulfill the covenant, covenant of the 400 years. This was how God was going to choose to get his people into Egypt. Not just say, hey, take a walk down the road, go camp in Egypt. This was the plan. This was the purpose. Genesis 50 verse 20. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Once again, it was not them meaning it for good and God, them meaning it for evil and God used it for good. It was them meaning it for evil, but God meaning it for good. In other words, there's intention. He intended these things to happen to fulfill a covenant and a promise and a plan greater than their own plan. All of their plans fell away because it's all part of one of God's plans, and that's what counts at the end of the day. But what's even more amazing is that this all points to Jesus at the end of the day. First of all, the lineage of Jesus came from the tribe of Judah, which I'll, I'll share with you in a little bit. But you see, there's a parallel between Joseph and Jesus. Joseph, first of all, was sold into slavery. Jesus was sold for his pieces of silver. First one, small one. Joseph was treated unfairly. Joseph was ridiculed. Joseph had to be going through all this turmoil. Jesus had the exact same thing, except so much worse. Persecuted, beaten, mocked, crucified. Jesus was like, there's like a progression if you look from Joseph to Jesus. The next one, Jesus, um, Joseph was righteous. He was righteous in everything he did, obedient in everything he did. Jesus was far more righteous than Joseph ever wished to be, never sinning. In the middle of the mocking, being tortured, all these things, he knew there was a plan and that he could trust that God was with him, that God had a plan and a purpose for everything that was going to take place. Once again, a progression. Joseph was a savior of a couple of people. I say a couple, probably a couple of thousand. He saved Egypt because of his strategy, saved his family. He saved the line of Jesus, the lineage, because Jesus came from the house of Judah. He saved many lives, like he said in the verse, the saving of many lives. Progression. Jesus came and saved the world if they choose to accept him. The ultimate savior. And so we see a parallel between Joseph and Jesus. But there's one other parallel that takes place, and that's not even a, with, Ju, uh, with Joseph. 
is a blessing that gets given to one of the older brothers. The older brother, Judah. Genesis 49, verse 8 to 10. Judah, this is now um, Jacob blessing all his sons because he's about to die. Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down to you. You see, Joseph isn't the only one having people bowing down to him. The brothers will also eventually bow down to Judah. You are a lion's cub, Judah. You return from the prey, my son. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down. Like a lioness who dares to rouse him. Who dares to rouse him? The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet. Until he to whom it belongs shall come and the obedience of the nations shall be his. You see, the lion, Jesus, comes from the lineage of Judah, the one saved through this whole process. And he's saying that the lion of Judah will come. Judah is merely the cub, the lion's cub. But there will be a lion that will come where the nations will bow down before him in obedience. The ruler's staff and scepter will not pass from your lineage. That's the blessing that he's saying. He's saying there was someone from your lineage will always have authority. Will always have the ruler's scepter. Until it gets to Jesus. And Jesus then has it and all authority going forward. And it's beautiful how it ties straight into Revelation. Revelation 5 verse 5. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. The lion of Judah is Jesus. And all of a sudden we see this picture come together. That the story of Joseph is not just this man who went through a couple of trials and God happened to bless him throughout it. But it's that little intricate piece. When the covenant is made, saying, I'm going to use you. My people are going to be 400 years, but eventually they have to go into Egypt. They're going to be oppressed, and then that's how it's all going to start. And then Joseph comes, and he leads the people by accepting his brothers back in, having that sense of forgiveness and saying, you know what, come live in Egypt. Then 400 years go by. Then Joshua takes the promised land which God promises him. And eventually Jesus comes from the line of Judah, which was preserved throughout this process. If Joseph wasn't in that position, his family and most of Egypt would have died because of the famine. And you see God's plan. And eventually that plan continues until the lineage is complete with Jesus coming one day again to reign and rule for eternity for all who choose. So Joseph is so much more than his little story. It's merely a puzzle piece in God's great plan for mankind, the savior of the world. That's what Joseph's story really is. He's playing his part. And I want to I say to you, what, what do we take from this? The fact is that you might not have to go to prison, okay? Maybe you will, but hopefully you don't, okay? But you might face trials in your life and you're sitting there saying, I don't understand what this is doing. You might be in the same situation where you're doing the righteous thing, you're doing everything right, you're saying, Lord, I'm doing what you're expecting from me. And then all of a sudden, things aren't going the way you want. You're still suffering. Things are still happening in your life. Like, I just don't understand what is happening. I'm doing the right thing. It's that moment where you need to look and say, you know what? What part is this playing in God's giant plan? There is a plan and a purpose for what we're going through. We need to persevere and put our trust and hope in God. Because why? We've seen it. We've seen his plan. And that's what we need to put our hope in and our trust in. That his plan is greater than our own. We need to take comfort in a God who plans. A God whose thoughts are higher than our thoughts. 